Good morning, church. And good morning to our Zoom group. And also to YouTube later. And I'll just say, give a shout out to um, Jill Humes for later. She, uh, Ronnie, she uh, texted me or messaged me. I can't remember which one. Uh, but anyway, she told me, she said, uh, she's going to be attending a gathering this morning. Uh, down on a beach somewhere in Florida, but she would watch later on uh, on YouTube. So anyway, hi, hi Jill, whenever you watch this on YouTube later. But also just to be uh, prayerful about Jill while she's traveling to Florida. Uh, she's down there to be with her dad. Her dad's going to be having surgery, heart surgery, and it's pretty serious stuff. So uh, just need to be praying for Jill for her safety, but then also that her dad's uh, surgery uh, goes well. Do you know what day it is, Rodney? For the... uh, it's scheduled for the 28th, but they're going to try and push it up. Okay, so just want to be in prayer about that. Um, go ahead and open up your Bibles to John chapter 14. Uh, John chapter 14. Last week, we celebrated Easter. Last week, we celebrated the resurrection of Jesus. And I know that a lot of times that, that we just move on after this. Uh, we go to something else completely different. And I started thinking about this. How do we really approach the resurrection of Jesus? How do you approach the resurrection of Jesus in your life? And I believe a lot of times that, that we begin to think that the resurrection, well, well, that's the end. You know, hey, it's done. That's what everybody was looking forward to is the resurrection. The resurrection is the end. It's over. It's done. But what we need to understand is, is the resurrection is only the beginning. Sometimes we feel like that, that uh, the resurrection that it was the end of God's miracles on this earth, that it was the end of God's miracles on this planet. And a lot of times we don't talk a lot about God's miracles in our churches. But we need to understand that the resurrection was not the end of God's miracles on this planet, but it is only the beginning of God's miracles on this planet. Resurrection was not the end of Jesus' activity on this earth. It wasn't the end of Jesus' activity in our world, in our culture, but it's only the beginning. You remember a few weeks ago, and, and, and there's, so many th there's so many things that this, this sermon came out of. Uh, and, and one of them is a passage we looked at in John chapter 14, verses 12 and uh, 12 through 14 where Jesus said these words Jesus said I tell you the truth anyone who believes in me will do the same works that I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with the father you can ask me for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. And I still wonder how many of us truly believe that Jesus, that these words He was speaking, is truth. How many of us really take serious the words that Jesus said? You know, we've been talking about that in class. Or is, was Jesus serious when he said this or when he said that and the things that he taught in the Sermon on the Mount? But the question I want to ask you this morning is, is Jesus serious when he tells us, you ask for anything in my name and I will do it for you? Because I want to bring glory. I want to bring honor to my Father. He told these disciples because he was getting ready to be crucified. And he knew that he was going to be resurrected. But he says, you know what? Guess what? I'm going to go and I'm going to be with my father. I'm going to be right there with him. But I'm not leaving you. I'm still going to be here. And so when you ask the father for anything in my name, I'll do it. 
And don't we see that? Flip over to Acts chapter 2. Don't we see that in Acts chapter 2? The first Pentecost Sunday, 50 days after Jesus had been resurrected, here's the disciples. They're speaking Jesus in all of these different languages, languages that, that they did not know. They had not studied all of these different languages. But they're speaking the resurrected Christ. And when you get down to Acts chapter 2, verse 41, the Bible there says that, that 3,000 people were baptized into the name of Jesus Christ. 3,000. Think about it. 3,000. 3,000 gave their lives to the resurrected Christ. 3,000 had their sins completely washed away. 3,000 were now filled with God's Holy Spirit. And then when you get to chapter 3, there's Peter and John, they're going to the temple. And as they're going to the temple, they see this, this beggar, this crippled beggar that's sitting there. And this is the only way that he can get money so that he can take care of himself was to beg. And as they were walking by and he was begging for money, they looked at him and, and they said, you know what, we don't have any money. We don't have any silver. We don't have any gold. But we'll give you what we have. And they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And the man immediately, he jumped up and he began to walk and he began to dance and he began to skip. And then the Bible tells us a little bit later on that because of that explosion, a growth explosion occurred again as people put their faith and their trust in the resurrected Jesus. Even when they were threatened, even when the disciples were threatened, With, with even death. They still spoke the name of Jesus. What is the name of Jesus to you? What is the name of Jesus to you? What does it mean? He tells us in Acts chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. The scripture tells us there is salvation in no one else. There's deliverance. For whatever it is that, that, that shackles you, that shackles me, there is no deliverance in any Thing else or anyone else other than Jesus Christ. And he continues that God has given no other name under heaven by which we are saved. There is no other name. There is no other person than the resurrected Christ who can deliver. And then I love Verse 13 and 14. Because he said, then the members of the council, they were amazed. The members of the, of the, of the, of the ruling group, the, the, the high priest and the, and the religious elite, they were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Now just stop and think about that. They were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. Last week we were looking at the resurrection and if you remember, there was no one, Peter, John, no one, none of the lady, no one was looking for a resurrected Jesus. That first resurrection Sunday morning. Nobody. Nobody was waiting at the tomb on Sunday morning, counting down backwards, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Boom, here he comes. Nobody was there. Nobody, right? Nobody. 
They thought it was all over and they were afraid. But now here you have Peter and John, they're speaking boldly. And it's very obvious because now the ruling council, they're looking at Peter and John and they're speaking so boldly about Jesus even though they have been threatened to no longer speak his name. And then it says, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in scriptures. They're just ordinary men. I'm looking at John, John you're, you're, you're not ordinary, okay? You're my friend, but you know what? We're, we're ordinary, aren't we? And Gary, we're ordinary, right? I mean, there's nothing really spectacular about any of us in, in this room. We're all just ordinary people. And they recognize that they didn't have any special training in scriptures. What was it about them? And he says so in the next sentence. He goes, they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. That's the key. It's being with Jesus. And it was very recognizable that they were with Jesus. So why are we not able to do what Jesus did when he was on this planet? What excuse would I offer up for me, David? And, and you have to answer this for yourself. What excuse would I give for myself for the reason that I don't call on the name of Jesus to do things in this world and in people's lives that, that need His salvation, that need His deliverance. What is it? Is it because that, well, what, I mean, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know my Bible well enough. What, what if they ask me a question? What if I don't know where certain scriptures are? What if I don't have things memorized or something? Let me ask you a question. Have you been with Jesus? Are you with Jesus? Can people tell that you have been with Jesus? It goes back to what we were talking about in class. Treating others as we want to be treated. Where does that come from? Aaron, does that come because you're just a nice person? I mean, you were, you grew up, I think, say you were, you were not from Tennessee, you're from the north. But you're still a nice person. But is that the reason why? No. Is it because of our parents? Well, if you've got Christian parents and Jesus-following parents, yes, that's part of it. But the fact is, it's because you have been with Jesus. We have been with Jesus. What was it that changed in... Uh, Peter and John? What was it that changed that, that, that caused them to be able to speak boldly about Jesus? And look at uh, John chapter 14. In John chapter 14, look at verse 15 and following. Look what Jesus tells these disciples before he is crucified before He is resurrected. And, and these words are for us too. Because Jesus says, if you love me, and I, 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 I don't have a shadow of a doubt that if I were to ask this morning, you know what, raise your hand if you love Jesus, I think everybody would raise their hand. I don't know if out of peer pressure, <laughs> but I think deep down all of us say, yeah, I love Jesus. 
But look what he says here. He says, well, if you love me, and if we love Jesus, we're, we're going to obey his commandments. It's not a matter of obeying his commandments so that he will love us. If we love him, man, I know he's got my best interest at heart. I know that he, that he truly loves me. And that he is God. And so I'm going to listen to him. Because all things were created by him and for him. And so since he's my creator, he's the best one that knows how to make my life work. So I'm going to listen. And I love what he says in verse 16. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. And the word is paraclete. And, and there are several different you know, other words that you can use for advocate, like counselor. But I love the word encourager. He said, I'm going to send you another encourager. And, and I, th I thought about that. And the reason I picked that word out, because when Jesus was on the planet, wasn't he an encourager to them? Man, he kept encouraging them. I think sometimes maybe that was the reason that they were so distraught. And downcast whenever Jesus was crucified and they saw him put in that tomb and they saw the stone put in the entrance of that tomb and they felt like, you know what, it is all over. How do we continue on? Because he was the one that encouraged us. I think about Mary Magdalene and, and she had seven demons that were cast out of her. Whether they were seven, seven literal demons or the seven uh, meaning whole, complete, they were just, I mean, she was completely demon possessed, but yet Jesus loved her and Jesus cast those demons completely out of her. And she was so drawn to Jesus. And now he's been killed and he's in the tomb and the stone is right there. Can you imagine the discouragement? Can you imagine the dismay that she felt in her life? How am I going to continue on? Does Jesus encourage you today? Because Jesus said, I'm going to, I'm going to give you another encourager who will never leave you. And he tells us who he is. This encourager that he has promised every single one of us who believe in Jesus, who love Jesus. Verse 17, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and doesn't recognize him. But you know him. You know him. Because he lives with you now and later he will be in you. As he's speaking to these disciples here, Jesus had not been resurrected yet. He had not died yet. The Holy Spirit had not come and lived inside of the followers of Jesus yet. But he said, you know the Holy Spirit. He's beside you right now. But there's going to come a time he's going to be in you. And church, that time is now. That time is now. He is in us. And then he promises in verse 18, No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. These are, this is Jesus talking to you, to me, to us. I will come to you. And soon the, law, the world will no longer see me. But you will see me. When's the last time you saw Jesus? And I'm not talking about with literal eyes, but in a, in, in with spiritual eyes. When's the last time you saw Jesus? Because Jesus told us, the world, they're not going to see me, but you are going to see me. And some of you may think, well, David, you really lost it, dude. What are you talking about? And I'm going to challenge you to look at your heart. 
Look at your life. Do you have the Holy Spirit in you? Do you see Jesus? Because he says, since I live, you also will live. And when I am raised to life again, you will know that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. When we're baptized, just like Ellery was last week, Man, you know, you, you were baptized into Christ. She was, and every single one of us that have experienced baptism in, 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 in our lives to Jesus, we're baptized into Jesus. We are in Jesus. But he says something else, and he takes it further. He says, not only are you in me, I am in you. Do you feel like Jesus is in you? Or have we just simply celebrated the resurrection and now let's just move on to something else? He says, those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my Father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each one of them. Do we see what Jesus is saying? Sam, Jesus is saying to you today, you know what, if you love me, then I want you to know my Father loves you, Sam. And not only that, but, but He wants to, I'm going to reveal myself to you. To you, Norma. To you, Jim. To all of us. He says, I am going to reveal myself to you. Do we live our lives like this? See, this is what the resurrection is all about, isn't it? Jesus didn't stay dead in the tomb. Jesus is alive today. And verse 22, Judas. And John, make sure that we know that I'm, I'm not talking about Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name. Thank you, John. Well, that Judas said to Jesus, Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? And Jesus replied, All who love me will do what I say. My Father will love them. And we will come and make our home with each one. Of them. And I had trouble reading that because when I read this this last week, I wrote the word wow right across all of those words with exclamation points. Anyone who loves me, My Father and I will come and make our home with each one of them. Jesus. The resurrected Lord is saying, Man, my Father and I, we're coming and we're making our home in you. Shelly, I'm, they're saying, I'm making my home in you. Can you? I mean, just, is that not mind-blowing? Lisa, does that blow your mind? That God says, that Jesus says, my Father and I, we are going to come and we're going to make our home in you. We're going to set up and set up house in you. So tell me again. Why we cannot do the things that Jesus did on this earth, and not only that, but even more than he did on this earth. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm tired of, 
I'm tired of trying to write that off. I'm tired of trying to discuss that and, and saying, well, no, you know, here's what he means. You know, simple fact, did he mean what he said? That's the reason he said, I'm telling you the truth. I mean, it goes back to what we were talking about this morning in Bible study. I mean, it's very easy, and and we kind of talked about this when Jesus said, you treat others the way that you want to be treated. How many of us just write that off? Okay, yeah, I'll treat Dan, Dan, I'll treat you right as long as you treat me right. Or I'll treat you right as long as it doesn't get me heated and, and bothered. It's time, church, that we quit trying to write off the words of Jesus. I know Judy and I, we were talking up here at the front after Bible study, and I mean, we we have a world that, that is so in need of Jesus. Would you not agree? And I'm not talking about with guns blasting. I'm talking about with love. I said it in Bible study, and I'll say it again. The greatest thing that's happened in my life the last five years is driving a school bus. Because it has caused me to see youth and students, but then it elevates into their homes and houses that are so desperate for love, for acceptance, for, for something. And we have it. We have it. I'm going to close out with Romans chapter 8, verse 11. So if, if you don't have this underlined or highlighted on your phone or something, I really encourage you to, to highlight this. The Spirit of God who, and, and that's capital S, the Holy Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. The resurrection was not the end. The resurrection was not the end of Jesus and His activity on this earth. And I'm going to say it. The resurrection wasn't the end of miracles by God. God did not run out of miracles whenever He did the resurrection. I mean, we see it all through the book of Acts. And I've asked, I've asked preachers and stuff and, and men that I have admired, and some of them are, 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 are so old now, they're, they're not even here anymore. And I, and I always would ask them, well, 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 where do you see? Where in the Bible does it say that, that God doesn't do miracles anymore? Where do we see that God doesn't gift us with spiritual gifts anymore? I mean, I know all the... And, 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 I would, and this is true, and it really hurt me really bad because I was sincerely asking. And they told me, you shouldn't be asking questions like that. And as I look at Scripture, I see anything but a powerful God that wants to work in His world. And a Jesus that is saying, you will do the very same things that I have done and even greater things. You ask in my name and I will do it. And church, I'm I'm imploring, I'm begging us, let's start asking God to do the impossible because He is the God of the impossible. Amen? And we have the Holy Spirit that resurrected Jesus from the dead living in us. 
And so often we feel like, you know what? Well, I just can't live the life on the job. You don't understand the place that I work. You don't understand the language. You don't understand this. I'm telling you, I hear it all on the school bus. Right, Gary? And right, Pat? We hear it all, don't we? But instead of us beginning to think, you know what? Who am I? Begin to ask yourself, who am I? Well, I'm a person that's filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The power that resurrected Jesus from the dead <clears throat> is living in me. And my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the resurrected Christ, He said, you ask my Father in my name and I will do it. So this morning, let's celebrate Jesus with the Lord's Supper, this time of communion. This is a time that, that we commune with Jesus. And I hope this morning as we commune with Jesus today, that you and I will ask the Lord Jesus, grow our faith, help, help, our, help our love to grow for you, Help us to take serious the things that you say. And Lord, get us out of this box. So Jesus, thank you. I know, Jesus, that you didn't die just so that we could come and sit in this building and, and do a little re rearranging of the furniture maybe inside of our lives make us look just a little bit better, sound a little bit better, smell a little bit better, or whatever. But Jesus, you died on that cross, and you were resurrected so that we could be complete and sinless before our God who loves this world so much that He wants to be with us and in us. To save people. Change our hearts, Lord. Change our thinking. Change the way that we go through our day. Lord, as we take this bread that's representative of your body, your body, help us to do so with this prayer on our hearts and on our lips. Jesus, What does it mean to me, to each one of us, that you gave your blood for me? How can I not love you? How can I not thank you? How can I not completely surrender my life to you to make room for you Jesus and and our Father God and, and His Holy Spirit to come and to live in us to take up house in each one of us thank you, thank you, thank you Jesus And Lord, I just pray today that we will realize who you are. You are with us. You are in us. And you want to work through us.